be here. Um, and I do have to make a um, disclosure in case there's any conflict of interest. I'm delighted to say that there are two members of this panel who are also trustees of the same board, on the same board. Uh, neither of them were deputy to vice chancellors before they joined the same board. So, <laughs> and we clearly choose very well. Um, so starting here, Professor Tarvan Nasibi uh, from the University of Kuzuri Natal. Um, Professor Ruki Way from the University of Nelson Mandela. Professor... <laughs> I was just about to get it wrong and get your first name before your second name. You said you were Diva, University of Pretoria. Um, we want to make sure that there is 
food on the table for our students. And so our strategy, in effect, um, is focused on, on that. Um, we also have picked up that part of the issues um, uh, in terms of the barriers uh, that students may experience related to the curriculum itself. So as part of an intervention from the Vice Chancellor, we've launched what we call a project renewal um, exercise where we are restructuring the whole university. We realize that a student who's doing a BSS uh, or piece of science would have various limitations of their load, which in effect means that they are not actually better prepared for the field of work, or in fact that you know they are carrying the same qualification but they have the same modules. So what we are doing presently shifting from having 19 schools to having nine schools that are going to focus mainly on the undergraduate uh, uh, um, uh, specialization for the students. So if a student is doing a Bachelor of Art, they're going to do that in the School of Art fully and comprehensively so we're able to monitor them directly. Last two points, we've introduced the first year experience program which is compulsory for all first year students because we say we want to make sure that we attend to the issue of transition, we want to attend to the issue of wellness, we want to attend to the issue of being able to uh, be financially literate uh, for our students. And also we understand that our students do not just exist in a vacuum, so we also have introduced what we call a crit critical social justice and citizens module, which we all must tell about in the media. And it's compulsory again for all of our students. The last point is this. Our efforts have largely been focused on, for, on looking at risk students who potentially could fall at risk. But we are now starting to ask ourselves, what can we do to support students who have potential to be outstanding? So we've also launched what we call a potential to large our project that is focused on those students. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jenny, and uh, let me just uh, at uh, this point say thanks to the Dresden Foundation, to Sadie, to uh, all of you as part of this network. We've been involved in this university for, I think, a bigger part of 10 years uh, with, uh, with this collaboration. My sense is that, that actually over the last 10 years, what we've really invested in as an institution, and I think about the key achievements, uh, at the university is, is given evidence-based architecture and ecosystem and infrastructure to really try to support student success in multiple ways. And when we first joined this collaboration, this partnership, I think one of the things we were very, very clear about was that we needed really, really good data from our incoming students. We didn't always have that data. And so we introduced a bio, uh, biographical questionnaire that, that really takes on board all of the kind of data, the very basic data for all incoming first year students. And what these data points allow us to do is to track these students across, across the course of the degree at the institution and for us to really assess them against those data points. The second thing was that we introduced a student success framework. And the student success framework has been integrated fully into our new 10 year strategic uh, plan, our vision uh, for the next 10 years that takes us up to 2033. And there are four real components to that student success plan, and it speaks in some ways to the dimensions that, uh, that Prof. Montaigne was spoke about a little earlier on, although it doesn't really address the pre uh, university dimension. But there's a dimension of uh, materiality. In other words, looking at what it is that is an impeding factor for students' success in the material environment. Access, fees, accommodation, food security, all of these dimensions. The second component is really health and well-being, and the institution has really put together an entire framework for mental health and well-being uh, at this stage to look after students. We have about 14 to 15,000 students who reside either on or around the institution at any given point. So this is their home for a minimum of three years, for some five years, for some a little longer. The third component of that is really a personal development, and it speaks to these elements of what do you do after uh, you exit from the university? How do you enter the world of work? How do you think about your career whether it's entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, service-based learning, work-integrated learning, 
all of these components built into the student success framework. And then finally, of course, uh, the academic support component, uh, which may contain everything from writing skills to uh, specialized tutorials, advisors, and so forth. Uh, the third component of, of you know, what, what I think would be an achievement, I suppose, to the institution would really be a comprehensive database of offerings that's available to every student, to every staff member, every advisor. So that every student, staff member, or advisor knows exactly where he is, that they can access whatever support is required at any given point in time and how to do that. And then, I suppose, uh, as we, we think about more recent developments, uh, probably the idea of monitoring evaluation. And, uh, what we would probably refer to as monitoring evaluation and learning framework. Most of us intuitively think that what we're doing works, but we don't always know that it works. And the idea of doing significant monitoring and evaluation really assists in us thinking through how it is that you allocate resources, the kind of strategic decision making that, uh, that, you, that you do. I suppose the last thing to say is that. Given the importance of data and connecting uh, these institutions to each other, the idea of a national student data warehousing project, I think it's going to be a really important thing for us to pursue. And we're hoping to collaborate on that with, uh, with all of you at least. Uh, because certainly what that allows us to do is to think about how these data sets speak to each other as institutions, but also how these data sets start to speak to the Department of Basic Education data sets and what that means for everything from predictive modeling to algorithmic modeling, uh, how does that we can think about what it is our students are likely to require before we even meet them. So, I leave it there, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, um, what lessons have you learnt um, in moving the student success needle at your university? And I would like to start with you, Professor Ryder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And I think the lessons learned is so, um, it's linked to the achievements and everything. So I really want to respond here. So, as you, you've heard, colleagues, um, yesterday, as was highlighted, that the University of the Free State has participated in the Seattle Millennium Network since its inception in 24. And when we reflect on the impact of Sierra Leone at UFS, um, it has helped us realize the contribution of this innovation um, in our initiatives in terms of student success and student experience. I think what's also important to note is that when we relate, when we think about student success and student experience, we need to link this to, to our visions. And most importantly, then, how we operationalize or realize the visions. And so, when thinking about the lessons learned at, at UFS, um, one of the things was around how we had to advance the student centered culture by significantly improving the student um, success rates um, while reducing, for example, the, the achievement gap. And that we do see as an, as an achievement as well. And furthermore, how we foster a culture of evidence-based decision-making. So a lot of us are, have spoken already about, and we're on day two, about the importance of data, and the importance of data to make data-informed decisions. Importantly enough, importantly also is collaboration and the development of partnerships, and so internal collaboration and building an institutional capacity in data analytics is important. Capacity not only for staff, but as we heard yesterday, the capacity for our students as well, and how students have stood up, stood and engaged and shared with us as an audience very boldly and confidently their role in, in the project. And how we can also then set a pathway for students to academia for these projects. We also, um, as part of the lessons, then developed models that would enable high impact practices. And so, for example, the, our academic advising, the tutorial programs, as well as the academic language and literacy development. Lessons learned also links to a national platform with other institutions, again, linking on the importance of partnerships and collaborations, where we can share and develop tools collectively and together. Um, the lessons learned helped to contribute to and enhance conversations on the transparency and accessibility of data and accountability within institutions. So 
on the usage of data, but not just as managers, to make sure that our academics are able to receive uh, the student profiles of data directly into their uh, computers to be able to make day-to-day -day decisions related to the profile of the students that they have in that country. Um, related to that is a concern that a lot of our AMS interventions have been very much student-facing, but not academic-facing. So um, what ends up happening is that AMS becomes a concern of individual academics who are in the teaching and learning portfolio or who are in student support services or who are concerned with the progression of students. But the general academic um, who is coming into the classroom and our lecture hall and is teaching doesn't concern themselves necessarily with what happens to the students. There they teach, they, the students pass a level, they will a and they move on. So what we want to do is to ensure that the academics have direct um, uh, engagement with the data and that the data is integrated across the system. You're able to identify who is a student and what is their progress and where they're going, what are the issues that they may be facing. At that point is a point that has already been mentioned, but I want to emphasize on this because we learned this from the 2.0 uh, intervention at UKZL. Um, Side of projects, um, whilst really, really good in terms of piloting and thinking through ideas, do not necessarily translate to systemic change. And I think that it's important that as managers, as we think about how to intervene and use um, the funding um, um, uh, available from Crest Foundation through this project, we need to think about specific systemic interventions that are not necessarily going to focus on individual academics and their research interests, but more on the system itself. How do we make sure that the system works? The fourth point um, concerns a shift, and Professor Tindall spoke about this earlier um, uh, when he referred to learning theories. UKZN prides itself as an, in, an institution that is focused on research assets. It's in fact, you ask us to do any project in which foreground research. Um, now, that's fantastic. And it's something that we've encouraged within this gene learning space through our interventions around this project of teaching and learning. But there is now another dimension that we ask, need to concern ourselves around, which is the science of learning. How do students learn? If we do not concern ourselves with this question, we're not going to be able to bring about this agility that we need. This entrepreneurial student that is going to be able to, at the point of completing the degree, be able to find new ideas around uh, being able to launch their own employment possibilities, or when they get employed in a company, be able to adapt to what is available. Uh, because we know that new knowledge is shifting, and it's, uh, it's, it's versatile, and we had yesterday with the introduction of AI, it's going to be very, very complex. So we need to focus more and more on the science of learning. And I want to mention this point, I had not listed it, but I could have mentioned it. I think that was one in monitoring and evaluation. Christina, who uh, uh, is in our office, has been talking to me about this ever since I arrived. The importance of monitoring and evaluation for uh, what we do within the space. Thank you. Thank you. Three guesses as to Professor Nsidi was a dean of something before <laughs> the retirement of the vice chancellor. Anybody know what it is? Okay, let's move, let's move on now um, to a more difficult question, which is what are the barriers to student success that you are still experiencing? And I'm going to start with Prof. Rigg. Thank you very much, Jenny, and uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, so I, I'd like to hone in on uh, essentially four barriers uh, to success that uh, certainly we have identified at the University of Cape Town. I'll start with finance, and uh, in fact, much of what I'm going to say in this uh, category has been shared uh, by Professor Moyne earlier. Uh, we certainly have a number of students who, uh, who battle, uh, who come from very poor backgrounds, who um, find it a real problem um, simply 
for example, we, you know, we have a food program at the University of Cape Town. There are other interventions. But consider um, the set of circumstances as one in, in, in light of um, the situation of a student who is expected to attend classes, do well, succeed. Uh, it seems almost miraculous that students who have these kinds of financial difficulties are able to, to succeed at all. Um, which really brings me to, to the second barrier um, to which finance is closely related, and, and that is the really combination of this form of psychosocial factors. Um, extreme stress deriving uh, in the first instance from one's financial circumstances, but also um, that social isolation, uh, the real difficulties in, uh, entailed in um, really adjusting to university life, to life at university, perhaps in a different city, um, being away from home for the first time, uh, not staying with one's family for the first time. Um, COVID had had quite a significant impact. COVID itself and also the, the period of transition back to, shall we say, almost normal university activity. There are some years beyond COVID, but nevertheless, those stresses are, are still there. The uh, third uh, barrier uh, is what I would um, categorize as workload together with curriculum structure. So, um, firstly, um, we, uh, we have at, at UCT a situation some, uh, in which our courses across the board uh, on average um, exceed the number of entry of credits by twenty percent Now, that does not suggest that our um, that, that we need to reduce the credit loads in all of our courses. There are good reasons why our curriculum structures are the way they are. Nevertheless, um, it is in many cases a problem for students uh, to, uh, to meet the demands of a particular curriculum structure for the curriculum load. Um, then, for particular students who are not at risk, there is the very carefully the, the, the curricula that they are registered for and determining how those, um, how their courses, how their credits, if you like, how their credit load might, might be adjusted in order to improve their uh, chances of, of success. And finally, uh, I would come to what we call six um, courses that impede graduation, that these used to be known as killer courses, so we have a very euphemism for that now. Uh, mathematics, Professor Jim, the main culprit, we all know that. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. I, I plead guilty as well. Um, and this has been the case for, for a very, very long time. Um, uh, you know, taking mathematics um, and uh, noting that it is a course that has to be completed by thousands of students in commerce, in engineering, for example, uh, beyond, uh, beyond the science faculty. Um, we, we see, and despite efforts uh, really over decades now, um, real difficulty in addressing the particular challenges posed by mathematics as a course for which our, our progression rates, our success rates are uh, suddenly shall say lower than they are for, for other courses. Um, I leave there, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Madiba from the University of the Western Cape. <laughs> Torela, I guess that's the language we use in Pretoria. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Talking about barriers, um, one of the biggest barriers uh, towards making sure that the uh, projects and, and all the efforts that we put end up showing fruit has to do with silos. And um, the, 
you know, being siloed, that's how our universities are built into departments and divisions and units. And when projects uh, and, and this type of student success uh, ventures are just limited to a unit or to a division, you deny that particular practice to be institutionalized. And in order to be institutionalized, it must be you know, scaled up and mainstream, and it must end up influencing the whole uh, university. But when you work in silos, you are really uh, shooting yourself in the foot. And I guess it's um, a, a lot of us, uh, but I, it is some, something that I also um, observe with my colleagues. We know it is something that we have to deal with at UWC. We have the, um, you know, already uh, the benefit that we are talking that analytics, we are talking, you know, diagnostic, not diagnostic, what? Okay, diagnostic. We are talking predictive analytics, and there is great effort in mobilizing the university to think data analytics and to make sure that we are data enabled and, and you know, we, we work and think with data on the radar screen. But um, when we work in science, we know that we kind of undo the very work that uh, we are trying to do at another scale. And, and the burden of working in silos is what you do um, in, in a small unit or department, if it, it, it's not uh, spread across, you will end up saying in your first year experience uh, influencing or impacting 73 students if you're lucky 105. But at UWC, we admit 5,000 plus first years every year. So if we are serious and we want to talk about retention rates of first years and you know their success rate, their progression, we cannot be celebrating the success uh, when we have worked with 103 or 73. But that's when we have to think at an institutional level, think about the first years. And this should allow us to have that mentality of working with cohorts in a cohort based way. If we are talking the first year experience, we are talking the first year as a cohort. And we know that we cannot just talk orientation that first week or two weeks. We have to talk about the, the first year. And then keep on using the data that we have to see if what we are doing with first years, for example, as a cohort, um, is yielding fruit. And um, I know that some of the interventions that we put in, in terms of student success, we will end up complaining, but we cannot, you know, measure the impact easily uh, because, you know, success uh, is multifactorial, if that is image. Uh, but then we forget that uh, what we do in our universities is really about those big rates, about retention rates, about progression rates about graduation and graduation on time. And if the work that we do is not institutionalized, and pulled out of units and divisions, and pulled at such a high level, these rates will never uh, be changed. We will continue to see uh, rates being very low. I really enjoyed what Prof. Stevens was talking about in terms of the student success framework and how it is embedded across the university. But what I enjoy even more is you ended up talking about academic support almost at the end, not that it is the least, but because we are talking about lives and livelihoods. So these projects that we do to enhance student success, uh, they shouldn't be put on the benefit. And that is also the challenge with working in a silent way. Some of these powerful interventions that are there in the university, if they are not carried out by people who enjoy powerful seats, like people who go to the city, people who go to council, their work is put on the periphery and it never enjoys the elevation uh, that it deserves. And because of that, the, the morale and, and you know, the innovation energy that lies in those uh, uh, voices that are put to the periphery are uh, um, brought of spreading uh, the impact across the university. And we really have to learn that we need to keep on uh, looking at the interventions and valuing the interventions that our colleagues are bringing into our universities and making sure that we break the silos and we institute
institutionalize these efforts. And when we do that, we'll start to see the needle ch uh, you know, shifting uh, at an institutional level. Thank you.
it becomes their homelessness to worry about students. That's why and we can go and institutionalize it much better rather than the deeds on the prison. Only the, the students support are the people who are supposed to get it. So they're here because they're going to be living. Uh, they see a, a, a tree. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's a very important question. What does it mean? Uh, Professor Madiba, we're going to move now to the issue of scaling, which you raised. <laughs> um, and so I'd like to ask Professor Stevens just to make yesterday in various presentations um, institutional needs raised the issue of having not been able to scale and various barriers towards scaling. So if you'd like to address that, please. Thanks, thank you. Um, so, so let me say that, that I think that colleagues have already mentioned, I think what uh, a feature, a characteristic of the contemporary university is that it's not really built for those things that we like to talk about, like interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity <laughs> and uh, working across silos, etc. In fact, the contemporary university is exactly the opposite of that. It is, in fact, built on silos, it is built on uh, the idea of disciplinary homes and so forth. Now, this is not a problem in and of itself, but what it does do, it does mitigate uh, against the, it, it mitigates the, the question of integration. And integration for us has been key to the idea of scaling. So, one of the first things I suppose I want to say about scaling, um, and we haven't gotten this all right ourselves, but certainly one has to be deliberate about scaling. You have to get it right, right at the outset. So, um, what this really implies is that you have to lead from the front. I think there has to be political will inside the institution, and there has to be some centralized leadership of these kinds of questions related to student success if you're going to drive this at scale. Uh, many of you are new to the partnership or coming on board the partnership. You're going to hear about the Student Success Committee. The Student Success Committee uh, at all institutions is a critical. Uh, committee. It is really critical. You know, for us it's led by a senior deputy vice chancellor, uh, it includes the uh, dean of students, the head of the center for learning and teaching, uh, ICT, the registrar's office, it has high level oversight over all of the lag indicators, the lead indicators, the interventions, the programs, and these are of course connected to faculties where they are teaching and learning units, these are connected to tutors, these are connected to advisors in some way. The point I'm making is that you have to be deliberate about integration because integration allows for coherence and coherence allows for scale. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the, perhaps the first point I want to make. Somebody was raising the, the, the I think uh, it's at UKZN, we were talking about the program for first years. We have a gateway to success program uh, that is part of our first year orientation and induction program that again we try to ensure reaches every single new student in some way or another. And that has various, you know, it's had various lengths of time associated with it. So the issue of scaling, I think, is partly dependent on integration, coherence, political will, uh, centralized leadership. The question of data, I want to come back to this question of data uh, again because. You can, lead, you can have evidence-based decision making, but you can also have too much data. We, we live in a, in, a, in a knowledge economy where data seems to be everything. It proliferates in every place. We are, in fact, our own data managers. Most of you are wearing Apple watches and you checking your own heart rate and your steps and all kinds of things. You're a data, you're a data manager. Yeah? We, we're managing our data all of the time. And so one of the things that we thought about, about how to, to manage this, this thing called data across the institution is to have a data management uh, and a data governance framework. In other words, why do you want the data? Who do you want to collect it from? Who's going to collect it? What are you going to do with it? And do you know the difference between data, data analysis, information, and data analytics? Because actually this all has a on how it is that you roll something out 
and how it is that you scale. And then the last point perhaps on scaling, Jenny, is, you know, I think they have to recognize the universities of bureaucracies. One of the ways that you institutionalize something in bureaucracy is to fit it into that bureaucracy through adequate reporting mechanisms. The minute you institute uh, and you implement uh, uh, any intervention that has a mandatory reporting component inside the institution at all levels, this immediately starts to institutionalize it culturally within the institution itself. And so, again, something to think about as we talk about the question of scale. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next to you. Yeah. 
are learning and teaching collaborative, where all of our learning and teaching um, takes place, and also include the psychosocial profitability that you're talking about within that collaborative, because we understand that the student, you know, is a whole student and needs to be approached as such. The third one is success coaches, and we will help by, you know, the Crescent Foundation for us to, you know, uh, start that um, with uh, two faculties at the beginning, it was engineering and I think another faculty, a faculty of law, and then um, we were able to say that using data to convince the university to buy into the idea that we do need uh, success coaches in each and every faculty, we've got seven faculties. And now we have them, and they've been internally you know, um, absorbed through our resource uh, allocation model. So they are part of you know, the institution. Can I catch a short Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, we, time is up. My orange. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm told. So we do have one more question and I'd like to ask the three who are going to answer this question just to give us one lesson. Advice to you, sorry, not one lesson, but advice for the new partners joining Sia Pumalela in June 2024. So if we could start with just one, thank you. Yes, the new partners must enjoy this platform as a networking platform. But remember, it's not only about receiving. It's also about giving, about contributing. Like it's not just about consuming, it's also about uh, producing. I have to share this, that at a recent colloquium, a, a colleague of ours shared the mental health framework that was developed through Siapu Medela. And in the room there were student affairs practitioners and many others, and the excitement around you know, that as a product. Um, was so fulfilling, but this is what Siapu Medela allows you to do. Just beyond just you know learning from others, you have an opportunity of also doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So, an important aspect that I like to share, or we like to share, um, in advice for the new partners is around doing student at the centre. A lot has been said about the diversity of the how our students and where our students. Um, as much as I come from. And so let's put the student at the center of the design of our initiatives, which really means that we ask the question, how are we the problem? Thank you. Thank you. Prof. Uh, thank you. So, um, one of the advice that I would um, give to our fellow universities uh, going to 3.0, this is something that I've uh, from chatting with my colleagues who are involved in the program is first of all the program really has to have the appropriate status and priority in the university. Um, the executive has to champion it quite explicitly, meaning the vice chancellor and the deputy vice chancellors. It has to be located formally in the appropriate committees, in our case uh, reporting to our teaching learning committee, which is the committee of Senate, um, in that ensuring that it has the appropriate priority, then if I could just quickly add one further uh, bit of advice, if you like, um, is the, as to the importance of making provision through resources and otherwise for building capacity so that those who are involved in the program are able actually to carry out the work effectively that other colleagues have brought into the program and also train if you like, uh, whether with regard to data analytics, the interpretation, implementation, interventions and all Thank you very much. What we had here was the leadership of the CFO Mayor Partner Institutions. We have always held dear in the Sierra Comunera that leadership is key to ensuring that student success moves from being a little niche in the corner to being institutionalized at the heart of the institution. And I think we have had many wise words spoken by our um, members here of this panel. 
and, and I hope that the new partners um, will be able to benefit from this huge wisdom. But um, the road, the journey has been started by most of the institutions. There's lots that they have learned, and lots of the partner institutions, the new ones, have actually learned, which can be shared back. We've already heard that. So I'd like to thank you very much indeed for your contributions, your thoughtfulness. Um, it really has been, for me, a very inspiring panel uh, to hear from, from you about the commitment that you are showing to our students, to our students succeeding, and to moving our universities forward. Thank you.